Okay. Yeah. Oh, we finally got there. <laughs> it's my absolute pleasure to get you to um, uh, get you on the other end of the, the screen. Wonderful. Yes, I mean, I'm just, I'm in quite a silo over here, not only um, academically, but also clinically, et cetera, et cetera. So it's just so nice to have some contact. Thank you. Yeah, well, we're, I think the three of us are very, Katie will pop up in a minute, I'm sure. The three of us are really um, interested in the same thing. So, uh, you know, we're on three different points in the world, but um, the opportunity to, to chat and put our brains together on the same idea is really exciting. Um, and I totally and, get you. I, and you obviously know a lot, you know, about Katie's thing. I, I'd love a little breakdown of where you guys are and, you know, all that sort of stuff, uh, where well, you are in your research, you know, all that, those bits and pieces. Well, I see if Katie, Katie, can you hear me? Um, she might pop up. Oh, no, she's coming oh, back. She's on twice. Right. I'll get rid of this, Katie, then. Um, ba -ba -bum. Oh, no, she's gone. Hi, sorry. Hi. My internet was not good, so I hopped onto a different internet, but I see there's two of me now. So that's yeah, I'm weird. getting rid of one of you, don't worry. There you go. You're gone. Hello. Hello, Karina. Hi, it's nice Katie. to meet you. Hi, nice to meet you too. I've been so looking forward to this. <laughs> me too. I love having meetings of the minds like this. We were just yes. saying it's yes. such an amazing, like since we've since the pandemic, because everyone's pushed online a lot more, these opportunities are coming up more and more. So Hooray. Um, yeah, so Karina was gone. Yes. You were just. Well, whereabouts uh, are you two in your path, progress? Where, just so I've got an idea of who I'm speaking to, I'd love to know your topic. I'd love to know where you are, just so I've got an idea of, of stuff, because you guys have obviously communicated a lot and I know nothing. So, Katie and I have been, we're both um, interested in kind of neurocentric. Um, treatment modalities in pelvic pain and interception and pelvic pain in general. Um, she's been doing some research with her local university, localish in Canada University for a while, um, which I got excited about probably about four or five years ago, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. And we've kept in contact since more and more. And I, um, we keep, we started doing things together, like a couple of pain courses and that kind of stuff. Um, I've joined, jumped on my PhD this year so I'm very early days um, working out what specifically I'm looking at, but basically I'm looking at interception in pelvic pain. Um, so how possibly how is that altered? I mean, you know how it goes uh, um, with funding sources come lots of different demands on you. So I'm trying to work out if I can get a nice happy medium where there is some funding, but I'm also pursuing what I want to be doing. So things may change. Um, I may be doing virtual reality, who knows, in augmenting pain through virtual mm. reality. Um, but I don't think I will be. I think I'll probably just be sticking to looking at how interception is changed in different pain states and whether that's an indicator, is that something we can measure, is something we can phenotype. Um, and Katie's been doing some stuff already. Do you want to say? Sure. I am a fake researcher. I'm not a real researcher. <laughs> I'm a clinician no. primarily. <laughs> Um, and I've just been lucky enough to have a, a local university that has um, a well-established sexual health lab. And they've let me kind of come in as, um, as a citizen to do some research with them. So I've been studying kind of the groundworks of how graded motor imagery might work in a pelvic floor population. My primary interest is in uh, pain with penetration. So we just, well, we just, a few years ago, I'm still trying to get it published. Um, we ran a study on uh, the groundwork of explicit motor imagery. So having women who have self-reported pain with penetration look at images of penetration and to rate their anxiety and their perceived pain levels in that situation. So I sent it off. It came back from the reviewers to ask to shorten the introduction. So that's what I'm doing right now. And we're getting ready to resubmit in the next couple of weeks. Nice. Nice. It's lovely because both of you are saying things that are so topical, whether it's phenotypes or how on earth do you use graded motor imagery in the pelvis, you know, how do you lateralize an abdomen? Um, yeah. yeah, well, we reckon that's what we were, we were chatting to Tim Beams recently, and we, we don't think that's probably a thing. Um, so we're at the point where so Katie and I back to interoception. Yeah, because it, it, we, we had this kind of circular chat about the fact that 
um, laterality works really well when you've got a peripheral area because you've got yeah. the visual drivers for that understanding and that visual element that allows you to proprioceptive to some degree. Um, but, and I, I don't, I mean, I was talking about it last night um, and telling them I don't really think that's where we need to go anymore. Um, but I don't think it's a thing in the pelvis. I think we can judge someone's ability to proprioceptive or intercept and their ability to put themselves in space, but I don't think laterality is probably a useful construct in the pelvis. Just like you say, like it, what, what value is it knowing the left of your pelvic floor from the right? The only extrapolation would be in musculoskeletal pelvic movement. Hmm. And I did my master's with original research trying to measure pelvic floor muscle EMG during gait. Ooh. I didn't, of course, have um, fine wire electrodes, nor could I use the maple, which can differentiate between left and right, because you can't wear it in an upright position. But we're all presenting on work or, or, or findings of pelvic floor activity based on testing that's been done in non-functional positions. But I agree with you about the, the so, so chronic pain has, has started peripherally and they've almost had a very poor understanding of autonomics and they get very excited in complex regional pain syndrome when they see autonomic changes. And of course, all of our work has autonomic impacts. Mm. So, so it's, it's, it's just trying to bring it together with, with chronic pain's got their laterality and we don't. <laughs> um, but we've got a lot more autonomic stuff. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's why I was interested to talk to you because I know you've got your head in the autonomics. Um, if you well, are yeah. doing upright <laughs> studies again, just as a aside, is it, Ra uh, Katie, is it Rachel or is it um, someone else or Lisa who are who are using the um, printed, 3D printed probes? Oh, I can't remember now. But I was just chatting with Lori about it last night about um, prolapse in the upright position because it's such a hot topic right now, how best to assess someone in a more functional position, right? But I remember what you're talking about, Julie, but I can't remember which one it was, but they did, they 3D printed something. I think, yeah, right? I think I think Elisa may be looking at it at the moment because she's trying to quantify if even it occurs, there is eccentric activity in the pelvic floor. How can we measure that? Because um, she does a lot of vocal work and vocal load work. Um, to do with pelvic floor so uh we can put you in touch with those guys if you're looking for probes that you can wear so, so, well i mean th that was in 2016 so things, oh, okay. things have moved on and i'm now on to my next endeavor um so what are you looking at lovely, so so i'm i'm looking at chronic overlapping pain conditions of which i see is obviously one of them okay. and i'm looking at the role of autonomic nervous system dysregulation mm. um and initially I'll just be I'll just be doing a study so heart rate variability is going to be my quantitative measure of autonomic nervous system function mm -hmm. and then on top of that I will use a bunch of questionnaires um, and I'll score my first phase is to score daily pain and stress and measure heart rate variability in chronic overlapping pain conditions and controls and see what differences if any there are and then extrapolate that onto an interventional study doing some technique driven type work to see the impact. And I don't want to go into that too much at this stage because that's still under construction. <laughs> um, and, and, I'm, and I'm scoring psychosocial variables at the beginning, including adverse childhood experiences. So it's a whole chronic pain states, biopsychosocial, autonomic thing. <laughs> Amazing. So, because we met at, um, was it on Carolyn's course? Or well, you did Carolyn's course? I did. I did I, I, so I've, I've met you a few times and before mm. then, and then I did your little Jilly Bond South Africa happy yeah. bladder thing that you did, did for us. And I mean, goodness, the, the way you dive into your phenotypes with IC and your microbiome is, um, oh, it makes me wonder if I know anything at all. <laughs> well, we, but we all say this all the time. Katie and I say it to us to each other all the time because we're just you're in your own, own little silos, and I'm, you know I, I know nothing about provoked vestibular denia or you know hands. Um, so <laughs> um, just so you know, from a mechanistic perspective, it's very similar to I see, <laughs> and this is this nociplastic pain and this pain state 
that our patients find themselves in with the comorbidity and then the psychological overlay. But the mostly plastic pain, chronic inflammation, um, comorbidity and psychological overlay and microbiome is going to come in there very soon. Mm. There, yeah, there's, there's lots of really cool stuff being done with the microbiome, which blows my mind and makes me really worried. So I'm trying to avoid the sun, as I can't see. Um, yeah, there's there's so much overlay because I think Katie and I get stuck. We've just done Mick Thacker's massive pain course and blown our brains a little bit. Um, yes, that's an accurate description. <laughs> I don't I don't even know if it's finished. It's kind of just petered out a little bit. Um, but trying to transpose what we now understand of pain into these models, we've kind of got a bit stuck, but we're kind of sitting in interception. And what I was interested is because where I see, I, I'm always floundering and kind of, I think it's second guessing and kind of saying, should, should we be looking at this? Because I mean, we will, but um, because half the time I feel like what we're doing is very psychology driven. Um, and that's certainly physio is moving in that direction, obviously within the scope of practice, but being that you've got that really lovely autonomic drivers and you can, you can really objectively test autonomics. Um, that's a lovely addition to, from a physio point of view, looking at the complexities of these pain conditions. What were you at the beginning of that? You just said you didn't necessarily understand where we were going with the pain. And then you spoke about interception. What did you mean by that? So I think both of us have had a, a well, I'll speak for me because I can't speak for you, but I've had my understanding of pain radically altered um, by an overload of basically um, neuroscience. Um, within predictive processing models and whereas before um i think the the level that i was at with noi group training and that kind of stuff we were understanding gmi to be very much um sensory motor cortex you know we're going to go to the premotor cortex we're going to do imagined concepts imagined activities and how you know we've we've been playing with how to apply this to the pelvic floor i'm sure i showed you a couple of videos of things i do with patients or i did before um playing with how we adapt this to the pelvic floor for a while um and then you overlay what what we now understand as our concept of a constant peripheral predictions happening at a cellular level a chemical level and how that's altered it has no intention i don't I, i'm kind of in this place where i don't feel that pain has an intention now or a or a um, what's it called a purpose purpose is the wrong word you know what i mean katie like it's not not a direct output i think right it's yeah that it, it is what it is and it's based on um our constant evaluation of input a bidirectional basically input and modulation of pain um and i mean how do you how do you summarize mixed course in in a minute i i had this struggle last night too um where noi focuses more on the neuro matrix model mm. and neuro tags mick focuses almost back to the periphery a little bit more and that constant evaluation is happening at every single step there's an ability to alter pain perceptions at every single step i think along that pathway as opposed to where noi focuses a little bit more on um, turning the volume yeah turning the volume up kind of in the central nervous system and perhaps playing with modulation kind of in, in descending control um but it's so philosophical i think that it's hard for a clinical mind to kind of grasp how to apply this in a more practical standpoint. And one of the things that Jillian and I talk about as well, that I personally have, I'm very unclear on at this point, when it comes to pelvic floor, okay, let's say pelvic pain conditions, where does the difference lie between interoception and proprioception? I find that I'm still foggy on that um, because where Jilly focuses a bit more on bladder, to me, that is a true organ. And where I focus a bit more on vestibulodynia, I'm a close to the pelvic floor. So there is a little bit of a motor component there as well. And how much of this is just, a, you know, we'll, we'll say women for this, for this example, their ability to sense where they are in space 
and how much of that is interoception? Like, is it vaginal sensation and awareness, or is it a muscular component? And that was really a word salad vomit that I just gave you. Sorry. <laughs> Um, I, I don't know when you last or last did some of the noise stuff. They had their master sessions and they've got them coming up again this year. But okay. a lot of it seems to be aimed at maladaptive learning mm. and threat learning um, and, and the neuroimmunology aspect with the, the, the immune system coming through so prevalently. Um, and the part that always blows my brain is um, what percentage of your brain is nervous tissue and what percentage of your brain is immune tissue? And I just love that. Oh, it's, yeah, I don't know. It's loads of, it's mostly immune function, isn't it? It's, it's 70 plus percent immune yeah. cells. And there's, yeah. and I love as well that you, you know, it, it is also your spinal cord. So your brain, you've yes, got brain not just the spinal the, not cord, just it's not just brain, spinal yes. cord. We always think of it as nerves, don't we? Yeah. yeah, I think, um, I mean, Mick was talking about that some of the concepts that are coming out with these days are moving a little bit towards kind of enveloping prediction um, as a concept. And like, I think he's, Mick has a go at him, but I think there's there's always been an element of that within the Neue work because, you know, going right back to when he talks about being bitten by a snake and then having this horrendous response the next time to a, to a grass brush, then that that's an element of predictive processing in his response. Um, and I think that's that's what we're getting at. Yeah, certainly the immune function stuff is really coming through really interesting, and that would tie massively into what you're looking at and what we're looking at in kind of where, from an autonomic function point of view. Um, it's a rabbit hole I'm trying not to go down. <laughs> it's, it's one that my supervisor has said, no, no, close that rabbit hole. You may not, that's another PhD, leave it alone. <laughs> stay on topic <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's difficult though isn't it i've got a um a google alerts for interception and one for anything to do with icbps and like the, i get down rabbit holes every day <laughs> there's a really fun one that's just come up today about endometriosis brain and how um uh, mental health issues and alterations in I'm going to say motor cortex processing in endometriosis are coming through <coughs> showing endometriosis brain. But, you know, we, we know this. I mean, like a, like a sweeping generalization in all pain states, we have these centralized maladaptations. Um, so it's, un, it's, yeah, it's, it's not, it's not like I wasn't expecting it. So going back to what you're doing, which sounds really interesting. Um, I know you're not meant to make judgments, but what what are you looking to find? What are you thinking that might be going on? I am hypothesizing that based on a paper published in Nature in 2018, structure and distribution of an unrecognized interstitium in human tissues, I am hypothesizing that there is a physical stress or sympathetic nervous system setting of a degree of rigidity is wrong, but it's a sameness that is influenced by this particular connective tissue that has been, this interstitium that has been recently discovered. And this interstitium would become restricted with surgery and any chronic inflammation or injury, et cetera, et cetera, and then other things that in, uh, impact it. Uh, but I think that that is one of the reasons that skin rolling, indicated for pudendal neuralgia, and the endomology stuff have the results that they do. I'm not saying everything is biological at all, but I do think that there is a, a biological interface with the autonomic nervous system. I know that on the pudendal neuralgia course, they treat that we're releasing loose connective tissue around the nerves. But in this paper, it is under the skin and around all organs that are subject to rhythmic compression and distension. Mm -hmm. So there you've got your bladder, your bowel, your blood vessels, your lungs, not your nerves, not your bones, not your muscles, your skin, not non-contractile elements. And I'm hypothesizing that there is a biological stasis in a sympathetic nervous system upregulation and whether surgery has left us 
biologically stressed, not from the wound, but from a restriction and a lack of movement. And, and I keep coming back to this thing that we are more what we are not. And the microbiome, you know, we know that the, uh, the type of bugs we have manifest as depression or anxiety or whatever. So, so our personality is an expression of the bugs inside us. You know, it's got very little to do with us to a degree. Um, and I'm just, I'm, I'm exploring with those sorts of things. So it's trying to not look at the biology that is there, but the biology that isn't there as an interface between multiple systems. So a, for instance, a endometriosis lap or um, removal of appendix, appendectomy, something like that, something simple lap type surgery would potentially cause restrictions in your interstitium. Potentially, it also might go some way to releasing restrictions. I just had a patient who had a uh, laparoscopy for cholecystectomy in her 60s. And two days after the lapscop, her, her uterus fell out um, and she'd had an old appendectomy and there'd been a lot of pain around there after the lapscop. There was obviously some scarring that was very usefully holding her uterus in place. And they, so, so but, but, but yes, any scarring, and we know this from pudendal neuralgia um, and other neuralgias, so, so any scarring or, or any, and, and we see it with our patients, our peritonitis survivors, um, but mobilizing not so much necessarily the bowel or the muscles, but looking at what is common between those tissues and the way that they would work in different stress settings. Okay. But you're omitting the nerves from that. You said this is more like an an well, you can't admit based. the nerves. It's just that my my hypothesis and my argument and my literature search hasn't disappeared off down. I'm I'm, I'm not doing pudendal neuralgia. Mm -hmm. Pudendal neuralgia is one presentation that manifests alongside many of the conditions that we're speaking about. And the reason I have to mention pudendal neuralgia is because the it's one of the few places in the literature that I can find reasonable literature that references skin rolling. With the International Urogyne Association, International Continent Society joint report on the terminology for conservative management of female pelvic floor dysfunction, yeah. BO 2017. Otherwise, it's Jacques Becco self-referencing. Uh, do it here because it indicates this, but his work just goes back to one paper in 1989 that doesn't actually even say that. So, so I'm, I'm not trying to say skin rolling works. I'm asking why do we see some of the effects that we do when we do this technique? What is actually happening here? And my hypothesis is instead of releasing connective tissue that's impacting our nerves, we are releasing and allowing movement in a way that is consistent with parasympathetic nervous system activity okay. and variability. So this sounds similar to the argument that's being placed right now with trigger point release. But trigger <laughs> points don't exist. Exactly. <laughs> that's true. But that's what they're saying is that for, like so many clinicians I, I find say like ischemic compression really helps. But I think where there's an argument right now um, in, in the literature, well, some, I mean, we can indicate that there is something happening, but we don't know what it is. And it's probably not going, what, what's happening is probably not what we have traditionally thought is happening. Yeah. Yes. And as, as I understand it, I mean, it, it's, it's localized sensitization. Yes, with everything from muscle splinting, your trigger point, to the hyperalgesia, pain on palpation. Uh, you know, normally non-provoking pain provokes more pain. Um, it's, sorry, allodynia or hyperalgesia. So, but just trying to trying to deconstruct what's going on. Uh, uh, what's so interesting is how quickly this is all changing. Mm. Uh, I I would agree with you that I think where I um where my mind goes to automatically when you say skin rolling achieves uh, you do skin rolling you see this effect my mind would go to because uh, my head's in mixed course um in changing the embodied predictive body schema so that that um so body model being a, being a much more fixed um interceptive awareness of the whole of your body you know that your elbow goes from here to where well, your arm goes from your elbow to your hand that hasn't really changed in 30 years or whatever um, apart from when you're growing up and that's why you, you fall over a lot because your body model isn't fixed 
So body model is a bit more fixed. Body image is psychosomatic, environmental, emotional. Body schema being that kind of constantly changing. Today, I'm not so bloated. Tomorrow I might be. I'm a bit more tight. I went for a run this morning. My ankles are a bit tight. That kind of changeable nature awareness of yourself. When we, when we touch someone in any way that feels nice, it doesn't feel nice, just so you know. What, skin what rolling? In, if we touch yeah. someone in any way, hang on, I've got a white awake child, um, you get a parasympathetic oh. nervous system response, a change in the body perception. Um, Katie, you can take over. I'll be back. <laughs> yes, Katie, I'd love to hear more about your work. Right. So um, I'm, tr I'm currently, right now, as I said, I'm, we're going through kind of um, the peer review aspect of publishing but i'm trying to gear up my brain on to what the second phase of working with images might look like and my biggest struggle is well the laterality discussion that we had before when i was just chatting with tim beams he's saying how laterality really is just a viable way to access implicit motor imagery and his suggestion to us was who cares about laterality? We're looking at something that's maybe biased a little bit more um, to um, uh, to just being able to have like a quick judgment so that it's not really accessing the primary motor cortex. It's almost in the premotor cortex a little bit more. Although I know the research is a little bit wishy-washy now about whether implicit and explicit motor imagery is biasing either of those cortices. So he made the suggestion of saying, well, who cares? Why don't you show, you know, flowers that look like vulva and have someone choose between vulva or not as a way to kind of fly in under the radar. Um, I've also mm -hmm. played with doing pictures and of vulvas and tilting them 45 to 90 degrees and just having someone guess left or right. So of the rotation, not necessarily the side of the body. So I'm kind of looking at that aspect, but primarily my, my interest lies in the explicit motor imagery, which is just visualizing particularly clinically with patients who you cannot yet really perform much of um, a manual exam because of anxiety or allodynia. And then the other thing I'm struggling with is phenotyping patients correctly because the psychology world, and that's the lab with which I'm working in, it's a psychology lab, um, has really moved with the latest um, with the latest relistings of pelvic pain conditions as the genital pelvic pain and penetration disorder, mm -hmm. instead of having the vestibular vestibulodynia and vaginismus mm -hmm. diagnoses. Mm -hmm. But I have this chat with Jilly all the time that I find that there are inherent differences between someone who has what we previously called classical <laughs> vaginismus versus someone who has a, a vulvodynia or vestibulodynia. And so I'm trying to decide how to phenotype that because I think that if we put them through kind of an explicit motor imagery um, protocol that we could lose some of valuable information of to who this might benefit more. So that's what I'm currently yeah. struggling with. They're very different patients. And I've got a lot of patients with vestibular dynia who, if you can get past that vestibule, which you can relatively easily in some of them, there's no vaginismus whatsoever at all. But penetration is not going to happen. And you can see why they're going to have a muscular response with a little bit of pushing in the painful area, but a non-pain provoking response. And they, they, don't have this vaginismus, but you trigger the area, and of course they do. Why would yeah. they not connect if it's sore? Yeah, fascinating work. We've got a few well, questions. Sorry, I'm jumping back in straight in. No, no, please go ahead. We have several questions in a row there. So the the starting question is, well, there's the basic science part of that. Is there, are there, um, can we phenotype, are there differences between different pain states like your vestibular dinners versus visceral pain states? Um, then is GMI effective or whatever we're going to call GMI effective in those cases? And then how can we phenotype that? And that is life's work. That's, that's going to take us the rest of our days to get anywhere near that because there's so much to work towards that. We don't have those answers. We can play around, but I, and you know, both of us, I think I want to be jumping in there, showing people pictures <laughs> and working out what's going on. But I know that actually, the the whole point of the ph my phd anyway katie's gonna do something different aren't you katie and um, you're gonna do the next part um is to lay down those basic questions of do we have differences now one of the things that i think we've made a really good step forward in phenotyping that might help us inch forward a bit is the free pack um which 
you know, I, I did a, I presented a case study of a lady yesterday who was 31 year old, um, one three year old, two miscarriages, who had um, uh, vulval pain, vestibular pain. She wasn't quite a, she was a vestibular dynia, but she had a, um, a small grade two postnatal tear, but mostly it was about birth trauma. Um, and she wasn't able, she was dyspronic, but actually she was not able to have any form of intimacy because it was just too painful. And what we did is we worked with a psychosexual counselor. Um, I, I phenotyped her with a free pack first and she scored. So I was like, you know what, let's try this because this is what we're doing. And just did loads and loads and loads of um, body schema mapping, trying to work out where she was in space for like eight months. <clears throat> And that got her better. Yeah, I assessed her four times, but they were therapeutic assessments. I wasn't trying to stretch things. I was giving proprioceptive input. Um, and I think that's, there are so many questions within this <laughs> of where we get to. I've taken over, I, I don't know what I'm saying anymore. Someone else talk. <laughs> I think what you're saying about phenotypes is, is, you know, unless we start differentiating about what the, various drivers and weightings of those drivers are. So some, someone might be highly biological like Hannah's lesions or um, chronic thrush, whereas someone else might have no Hannah's lesions, no history of anything going on in the pelvis where you just suspect why things are switched on, but it might get worse when the boss walks in the room. So here we've got a psycho or a social factor. And then when you bring trauma in um, with adverse childhood experiences and how that sets a new physiological baseline. Mm -hmm. um, and then we start diving into Stephen Porges and polyvagal theory and it all, which I have some problems with, um, but we're not gonna get into those now because I don't understand my problems well enough. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand polyvagal theory enough yet. I haven't looked into it. But Katie, yeah. you've got to say something at this point. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's my turn to talk, right? What should I say? Uh, I, I've been, well, I'm kind of wondering, I'm going back to kind of what you're, what you're saying for your research, and I'm trying to think kind of clinically how this applies. And I'm just curious right now, in your clinical work, how are you assessing and objectively measuring autonomic dysregulation in your patients? Hmm. So at the moment, I am not doing an objective measure of autonomic nervous system function. Um, I do score psychosocially, and sometimes I score for ACEs. And then I assess with everything from a really, really good subjective, and we decide whether we think this is more biologically pelvic and whether we're using ultrasound or internal. Um, I then do skin rolling for when I consider there's a sensitization or a neurological component, definitely when there's anxiety. We've got visceral manipulations um, as another point of assessment. And then, if, and then I'm very much based on the breathing movement, um, novel movement, et cetera. So I'm, I'm, I'm not, um, at the moment, I'm not quantitatively scoring. But what has happened clinically, what, what really got me clinically is you, someone's got been referred with pudendal neuralgia and they've got IC and IBS and everything going on and they happen to have sick bone pain that's aggravated by sitting in a leave sitting on the toilet seat, whatever, whatever, with the whole story and all the surgery and all the trauma and all the blah, blah, blah. And then you have done your internal and they're hypertonic and you've released it a bit and got them to down regulate and breathe and think, and you do some skin rolling and they come back and they say, my pain's a little bit better, but I haven't had a headache. I slept through the night and I've had a poo every day since I saw you. Yeah. And those are all the auto and, and it's everything from thermoregulatory changes. I've got a young 22 year old who has hot flushes after the session to changes, mark changes in anxiety. And I've seen some really, really disturbing people who've had very bad arthritis, neck arthritis and TMD. And, you know, oh, the doctor told me I've got, you know, I've already had some surgery, I'm going to have more, and you're busy doing skin rolling down at the pelvis, and their neck is getting better. And then you say, well, if we skin rolled up to your ribs and your neck responded, you know, can we skin roll across your chest? And I've had patients whose sinuses have cleared and can hear the door, the alarm that they couldn't hear because of the sinus blocked, and now they open the door and they hear the alarm go beep, beep, and it's all very exciting. 
you know, there are those objective measures. But that's why I'm doing the PhD, because I have no idea what we're doing. I do not believe we're releasing tissue around nerves, which is what the current clinical paradigm is without research. And I'm, I'm not, a, I'm not trying to research pudendal neurology, and I'm not trying to research skin rolling. I'm looking at autonomic nervous system activity in chronic overlapping pain conditions, and then I'm going to do this intervention, which happens to be skin rolling. And we're going to see what, if any, changes we see across multiple domains, including daily pain, stress, autonomic um, heart rate variability, and then other questionnaires. I'm, I'm trying to understand what we, what, I'm trying to understand what the hell we're doing. <laughs> It's such a vast idea. And thank you for explaining that again, because I feel like, honestly, for the last year, I feel like I'm free falling and everything that I knew about pain and treatments. I'm just like, I, I can't even, I sound like an idiot. Like I can't even make proper sentences and structure ideas anymore because one thought just jumbles into another train of thought now. Like it just seems to be so encompassing that it's almost overwhelming to think of it as a researcher and as a clinician. It's one great big gray fog with lots of swirling places that are denser with stuff. And then occasionally there's a little clearing and you think, oh, that bit makes sense. And then another gray swirl comes in. <laughs> mm. um, and the more we learn, the more we really realize we just don't know bloody anything at all. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I'm with you on that one. Um, what can you take me? Because I know that you said that um, the interstitium is the thing. I'd love to read that paper if you have it to hand to Send, I'll to us. send it to you now. Thank you. It's a um, it's a lovely little paper. Um, it's a this tissue. Sorry, can, can I just? Yeah, no, I, want, I just wanted to ask about the tissue. Like, what what are the qualities of this tissue? So this tissue is fibroconnective tissue with fluid filled spaces, and traditionally, the moment you have done an open excision, the fluid is drained away, and all you got are scraps of fibroconnective tissue. And you will remember from our dissection days. You know, you very carefully take out this and you take out that and strip away this. And then there are those funny little pieces that you throw on the floor. And in the body, when the fluid hasn't been drained, it's almost a lattice work. And in fact, let me just share it quickly because I've got it here. And I'll send it to you. Articles, structure and distribution. Come along. And this is what the osteopaths got so excited about a few years ago with, with and the video that was made popular, I think. Yes. And from I have absolutely no idea. I hypothesize it's the tissue that we're treating when we do. We, 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 I, I, I hypothesize that this tissue is impacted with acupuncture, but I know nothing about acupuncture. Sorry, my computer's on a bit of a go slow. That, I mean, that tissue's fibro, fibro collagenous. What did you call it? Fibro. If, 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 if yes, um, can I, um, come on, did I spell that wrong? Stro okay, I'm just every time that I go into my there. files at the moment, I <laughs> it's the same. I keep thinking I need to organize these. Um, well, it's not just me, no, I've, I've got it in here, it's just my spelling is doing something really weird. Because, <clears throat> how, how does that tissue then interact with the autonomic nervous system? Does it have autonomic? So this tissue is continuous with itself. And it surrounds all structures subject to rhythmic compression and distension. So and how would it that... affect, blood I mean, you know, I can see so, how it would affect blood pressure, but how would it affect heart rhythm? How would it affect? So in a sympathetic upregulation, we have less variability. Mm -hmm. We have, here we go, I'm just going to open it quickly, share screen. We a host disabled, oh, okay, do you want no, me to email it to you? And what do I need to do to allow you to share? I don't know. You have to make her a host, a co-host. Um, in oh. participants. There you go. I'll do it to you as well. Yeah, co. I'm a host now. Here we go. Let's share. Share. Here we go. Structure and distribution. Ah, oh, you bastard. Did it share? It's sharing. Okay. So let's make it a bit bigger. That's it, yeah. Um, you can see it, you've got it. So they use this confocal laser endomicroscopy during, um, here we go. I haven't got it. Yeah, we still screen. got a black screen. Okay. Is 
Seriously, still a black screen? Yeah. yeah. Isn't technology fantastic? <laughs> Why is it doing that? This, this, stop share. You see, I'm sharing, stop share. Reset. Okay, let's try it again. Share. The bottom of share sometimes is some other little buttons that you share with full graphics or full sound. Slot the share. Here we go. And I want to share structure and distribution. I want to share the PDF. Share. How's that? Nope. Give it a moment. I'm just sharing a PDF. Seriously, still no. No. Julie, I'm going to email it to you. Okay. I'll, yeah. I'll send it oh, to both no, of you. No, we got it. There it is. There it is. You've got it. You've got it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, here we go. So over here, uh, we've now got, they did it during um, cholecystectomy, and they removed the tissue and flash froze it, um, and keeping it, and then did a special stain. So it's this whole thing. Here's the, the fluorescent microscopy. That's what it looks like. Mm -hmm. and this is then the structure of the tissue. They've got various different stainings, and they're trying to show these fluid-filled spaces and how the spaces get eliminated when the fluid drains away, and then there's various stainings, and this is their schematic of it. And when I show this to the pain people, they get very excited because they say that these, these cells lining the bodies look like glia, and then, of mm -hmm. course, that just opens up a whole other can of worms because, you know, the trash of the system becomes the glue that holds it together, you know, or the, the glue and all it was with that actually becomes a lot more significant. Um, and this tissue is, it's about where it is that's the interesting part. I, so it's not I remember the big organs. thing about interstition being the new organ being discovered, but it was, I thought it was mostly surrounding the bowel. Here we go, this is where it is. It's around all tissues, subject to rhythmic compression and distension. Okay. Because which, it, because it has, an, a, has a function in compressing or? So they have given it the nickname. There is a chocolate, which you're gonna to have to self provide for whomever can guess the nickname. <laughs> they call it the body's shock absorber. Oh. Profound, oh. isn't it? And when we see ourselves in a sympathetic upregulation, <gasps> there's tension in our muscles. We've got shallow breathing. We've got a certain limited heart rate. It's very high, but there's very little variability. We've got a more consistent and high blood pressure. And I'm hypothesizing that this is a biological stress setting, that when there are restrictions for whatever reason, chronic inflammation, surgery, injuries, sitting around too much, not enough movement, um, endometriosis and restrictions, or well, whatever the thing is, that that is almost a biological stress setting. And then when there is better movement through this tissue, there is better movement of lungs and bowel and bladder. I've just seen a young eating disorder lady who's six months out of rehab, and she came to me because she cannot feel either bladder or bowel function. And we've done two sessions, we've scored her and all sorts of things, but we've done skin rolling and she can already feel her bladder and bowel. And are you so, skin rolling over the abdomen or over the perineal area? I'm skin rolling from the knee all the way up to the ribs, if it's pelvic. And if they've discussed breathing or there's some, there's a breast cancer or TMJ or headaches or sinuses, I'll go up to the top of the chest. I've skin rolled across breast implants before. I don't want to sound like skin rolling is the thing. It, I, 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 it's not all about skin rolling, but it's just a very interesting, it's very interesting to see multi-systemic responses mm. that we see clinically, and I want to know what's going on physiologically. I mean, that, that all makes total sense within, from a systemic response point of view. I think we, I, I can't give you the science, but I think I feel it clinically. I think we all do. Um, I can give you the N of one of me as well, which is really hard to take the clinician and the, you know, the experience we have. But so when, when you are skin rolling, and I know skin rolling is not the thing, it's just your way into the system. Um, when you're skin rolling, you are stimulating nerves within the skin. 
mechanoreceptors, I, uh, you know, we're stimulating all the receptors that are in the skin. Uh, there's the touch modality, so I'm looking at whether I need to use just a sort of effleuragey control in my intervention, uh, because I, I'm not going to be sort of trying to present this as the protocol that we have to do. Um, mm -hmm. But I might need some other kind of touch intervention to control for the effects of touch. Um, I'm certainly not going to start cross frictioning everyone. Um, but reflexology. That, well, I sort of would want to touch in the same areas so that I'm not introducing too many variables. Okay. So that the 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 analogy I often give to my patients: imagine wearing a wetsuit that is three sizes too small, and it's kind of put on a little bit skew. You see how nothing really works, and we're going to get you into a wetsuit that fits a little bit more comfortably. And a lot of them feel that sense of rotation or that restriction. Of course, what it also does is it often, like unwrapping onions, um, you know, they go, well, I haven't, you know, my knee hasn't bothered me since I had my hip. Um, and we do this and hips feeling a lot better, but now my knee's a problem. And we are just recreate, we're, we're going back to an earlier version of dysfunction or yeah. dysregulation or maladaptive behavior or restriction or motor control or whatever we want to call it. But yeah, and I, I think we have, I mean, you know the Fitzgerald papers in my fascia release? Yes, yes. So the, the first Fitzgerald paper um, where they did it in men and women, they did global massage and men responded very well to global massage. Yes. Um, and part of that was an effleurage type stuff. And they, they had, you know, they didn't look at psychosocial domains, but they had massive responses. They had women responded much better to the pelvic floor specific than men. And I think there's a lot of um, psychological and intimacy related issues with that just because of access for men is a very not um, socially acceptable thing, accessing only. Um, and that would that would be a lovely explanation, I think where where we are at the moment is very much that you know you touch someone you get an improved parasympathetic flow you get release of endorphins and cannabinoids endocannabinoids you get a parasympathetic relaxation of all the tissues but also from a anterior from a or frontal cortex inhibition of um of threat i don't like that term but not, you know of, Hmm? modulation yeah 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 modulation counter irritation stimulus that kind of stuff and that creates a whole body relaxation and i would i would agree with you that um uh you know I'm, i must say everyone knows this we've had it with lots of patients i must say, you know i went for a massage before christmas i was particularly anxious and the next day two days later i was just like wow my anxiety is lifted from being touched lots having lots and lots of lovely what i thought was lots of endorphins and just feeling lots physically better but so it would be really, I'm very interested to see what you come up with. So there's one other thing that's in my mind that's, um, there's lots of lots of theories. I like gathering theories and I like going to, um, I, I, I like going to courses where I don't think, um, where I think I don't understand what they're trying to say. <laughs> and I don't think there's anything in it. And I often find that actually there might be something in it. It's what I come away from. So I went and did connect therapy. Um, I did a couple of the courses when they were over in the UK. Okay. Uh, it's LJ Lee, so um, kind of a similar. She to was with Diane Lee. Yeah, thoracic rings. Yes, got, it, got it. Got so it. Oh, the ring shifts and all of that stuff. Got yeah. It. So I didn't. I didn't think that had anything in it. Um, and then I went in the courses. And as a little backstory, I've had open heart surgery, um, and they played with my ribs, and my world changed. So I couldn't move my arm. My arm would go to about ninety degrees until whenever I went on connect therapy um, as a laugh because I like learning um, and what they did and what I then and I have no explanation for it but I continued to see a lovely guy called Darren who's also doing a PhD in connect therapy and, and lots of stuff um, in London after for a while and he plays with my right ankle and my right kind of the the fascia that really hurts along the inside of the calf and I can feel my chest open up and then my arms work um, and I can breathe and I don't have chest pain and lots of other stuff. Um, and I've always intrinsically felt it and talked about it and been interested in it in courses and kind of trying to work out what it meant. And at the time, Darren and I, I mean, again, it was Neu Group Central understanding of brain function. And we were thinking, 
or you're discussing and saying, well, are there linked neuro tags that if you release, so he, he can literally get, so my interception is very good. I've had lots and lots of surgeries. Um, so he can play with my right heel um, and it fits, starts to feel lovely in my chest and I'm not waiting for it, but I, I know it, it's just something that I will be ignoring it, trying to not think about it, trying to think about my heel and then it, I'll feel it open up in my chest. If he plays with my right one, I start to feel sick. And my other one, my left one, he starts to feel sick. Um, and we were playing with how it going, well, maybe this is nausea, how interesting, how interesting. Yeah, I, I'm massively wound, you know, I'm physio heal thyself, oh, that's what we're always doing. I know what I want to do with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, loads of medication, loads of open heart surgery uh, into the intrinsic autonomic nervous system drivers and, you know, the, the bundles along my thoracic spine. Um, I'm hugely wound, so I know I'm very, I'm massively placebo driven as well and all this kind of stuff, very aware of my issues. But... Um, we were trying to rationalize that as a connected neurotag response, which we know is one of the concepts that they were thinking about, that from a motor driven point of view, you can have these connected, um, you know, nerves that fire to wire together, fire together, or the other way around. But actually, from your point of view, um, the, the neurotensegrity people that we love, Katie, would um, say that it's a continual fascial release. I don't think that was happening. Um, I think it was a lot of endorphins. And suddenly things can move a bit better. And I feel it very much in the areas that I have very good interception. Um, but from your point of view, that would be interesting if it's a, a shift in an intrinsic shift in the interest interstitium um, set point. So for that, he would have needed to have mobilized the interstitium, which one of the tissue types that it is around are muscles and fascia because mm. of the contractile nature. So it's kind of maybe less uh, weight-bearing, load-bearing force distribution than a fascial release and more shifting of the set stress point mm. and subsequent parasympathetic, sympathetic firing. And I can get behind that as well, just as a, you know, it, it was a pain, it's a really painful technique. I still take a spiky ball to my right calf. I run a lot. Um, and that will do it. And that will make my chest feel like I can breathe again. So. I'm happy with it. I rationalizing it being a parasympathetic response to a painful. I, mm. I have a question. And just since you brought up the spiky ball, Karina, when you do your skin rolling techniques, are you going above noxious threshold or is this a non noxious input? So, and yeah, so this goes against um, Diane Jacobs and the neuromodulation where we, and, and of course, central sensitization where we don't want noxious inputs. In fact, when it's normal, it's fine. You know, it's fine. It's not sore. When it is significant, it is either numb or painful. And sometimes we only do a little bit in a session because it's painful and because you haven't got the buy-in. But you do a little bit in a session and then you, I get a WhatsApp half an hour later going, I've just got home and had the world's biggest shit. Yeah. <laughs> well that you know that is a massive endogenous and then they and then they don't mind that it's sore and then they say go on do it which doesn't mean that you just mindlessly attack your patient but but some of the sessions are are quite difficult and sometimes I can't do it even though I can see how significant it is I can't do it because it's 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 too much so then we don't and then it's back to the you know yoga breathing uh worry journaling descriptive writing, trying to trying to work through some of the other methods of calming down the nervous system. Um, thoracic rotations and extensions, depending upon, you know, depending upon which hat you're wearing. Are you an orthopedic manual therapy severe? Are you a mm-hmm. psychologist? You know, where are you coming at this thing from? And my, my, oh, sorry, go ahead, Julie. No, 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 finish. I was going to say my second question to you, because I do have, um, I teach on the subject matter of C-section. Um, do you have an opinion on fan and steel incision scars and how that might be affecting interstitium and the responsiveness of bladder and uterus? Yes, ab- yes, that, you know, you, it's so tight around that scar and whether you're going with a visceral manipulation mindset or um, paradigm of we must separate out these layers um, and you've got to then separate, go through your various layers sinking deeper into the pelvis with and or whether you're trying to do some scar release this is not so much about the scar release it's not so much about the scar but about what the scar has now tied into 
and caused a restriction in other tissues that need to be contractile. And these are our les lessons learned from mesh. They introduce non-contractile elements into an environment that needs contraction and distraction for, for, for function. Mm. So, so uh, sometimes you skin roll and whether they've had an appendectomy, cesarean section, curly cystectomy, hysterectomy, prolift, mesh, whatever the thing is, there's, there's a sense of space and things just work better. Not always, because for not everyone is this tissue a problem. It's only when it is significant, but there are there can be some quite profound change. My peritone, I've, I've had a sample of about 12 survivors of peritonitis who they come in and they are fucked. Mm. Fecal incontinence, urinary incontinence, zero sexual function, lots of pain. You know, they're just fucked. One dude got blown up by a landmine and couldn't feel his feet. And another chick fell out of a third story window voluntarily onto the top of her head, which opened like a star and then blah, 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 blah. And then others are medical, blah, blah, blah. All these terrible, terrible things. And you do some and, and these patients, respond i had one chick who was a medical legal case where they're just completely cocked up so that she had a cervical cancer and then they did a hysterectomy and they cocked it up and ruptured her bladder and she got peritonitis and then she had a fistula and she was just leaking urine constantly a uh, viscovaginal fistula and we did some skin rolling and this fistula closed how does it close mm. biointegrity was something restriction holding it open the fistula closed she went back for a standard cystoscopy with the prof that she was under. She got into the car park, had a panic attack, started leaking again, but refused to go in. She came back for one session and we did some more and the fistula closed, her leakage stopped, which I can't explain unless going at this from, and, and, and biotech integrity is a great way to describe this tissue, but it is a tissue of cobwebs rather than a tissue of structure. And I think the challenge, I mean, it's really interesting what you're saying, but the challenge in, in um, working out what's going on and therefore setting our intent as physios is to divide up where, when you've done a skin rolling or a hands-on technique, we're getting a perception of change for very much a perceptual embodied experience, neurally driven, um, emotionally driven perception of improvement versus a biological change in those in that interstitial tissue. Well, I it would depend on how you're scoring your patients as to whether you consider me saying, I, I have a bowel motion once a week to I now have a bowel motion once or twice a day, whether you would consider that to be an emotionally driven response or a biological response. It's got to be both, though, hasn't it? Because the bowel is well, so because it's, hormonally but, driven. But it's biopsychosocial. Yeah. And of course, yeah. we know, and, and women, we keeps coming back to, okay, so not only a vulvodynia and endometriosis are exclusively female-linked diseases, X-linked conditions, but that estrogen and, first of all, our cycle and estrogen uh, plays such a role in pain expression. Mm -hmm. So we see, we see gender and ethnicity as gender, ethnicity, and local target tissue variables, Hunter's lesions with chronic candida, you know, IBS, FODMAP problems, whatever the biological basis is in the tissue, we're still, and some patients are almost exclusively biological, but many of them have these psychosocial drivers as well. You have to treat the patient, you can't treat the tissues. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. I think it's just it's gonna it's important in teasing out and finding ways to make sure that uh what we're doing and what we're talking about doing are the same thing. So yes. There's been a number of papers, as I said, like Katie and I have been through recently. Um, and one that springs to mind that for me it was basically akin to homeopathy, what they were talking about. But they, they just had huge amounts of theory, but there wasn't actually any assessment of the actual thing that they were talking about doing. Because as you said, it's really, it's, it's impossible to take away the um, psychosocial from the bio. And we shouldn't be aiming at the bio on its own all the time. 
So that's why I'm using heart rate variability as a measure, quantitative measure of parasympathetic nervous system, well, of autonomic nervous system function, because I do not just want a collection of data points that indicate that my patients, uh, patients felt better after two sessions or, you know, that's not what I'm interested in because then we then we're diving into the therapeutic and alliance and is it because I listened to them and is it yeah. because they felt seen and heard and all that stuff I want objective markers and Do, measures just yeah. as a thought then would uh, I mean thinking of objective other markers so if you're I mean it's, I've got two questions that would lead into one so first off my my answer would be is there some way that we could look at if you're saying that it, it coats anything that compresses so muscular activity as well um, is there some way that we could look at EMG data in people that we know are parasympathetically okay versus ones that are sympathetically wound? Is there a difference in the resting EMG of a muscle that's not associated with what you're doing? Is there resting EMG different? And I think we'd probably find, you might be able to answer that. And secondly, how is the interstitium then different from fascia? Because a lot of what you're talking about, people in the fascial world would be arguing as well. So Fascia, I would understand as being dense, organized um, connective tissue, as opposed to loose connective tissue. Fascia would be load bearing or weight bearing and would, yeah, fascia has more of a structural component and this has more of a sponge or the body shock absorber component. Mm. And, and as interesting as your EMG thing is, my aim was on EMG and I'm now bored of EMG. Mm -hmm. I'd much rather look at inflammatory markers. And in fact, there was a little word whispered in my ear that it might be interesting depending upon if we do get something when we move on to phase two with, with the intervention. Because at the moment, it's just trying to look at daily pain and stress in chronic overlapping pain conditions and normals. And maybe the normal people will have loads more stress, but no pain. And the chronic overlapping pain conditions were very little stress potentially or huge amounts who knows what we'll find and lots and lots of pain and then we're going to look at the heart rate variability and see what measures over well, what differences we have but you know n equals 20 or 40 come on am i making you know come on anyway especially when you consider phenotypes and i've got nine chronic overlapping pain conditions yeah, you're gonna be doing this forever <laughs> no i'm not <laughs> So there was a little, depending upon how phase two goes, there might be a possibility to skin roll whilst doing functional MRI. Oh. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. We, just, we have to see how phase, phase one goes and then we'll see how phase two goes. I would like to introduce looking at inflammatory markers again as another measure of pro-pain, pro-nociception, pro-inflammatory states and sympathetic versus parasympathetic function. Um, and the EMG is interesting, but it's just, yeah. Too many variables. Feels like a, it's, it's, it, it, well, it's, it, it's, an, it, it's just now a whole other arm. Mm. <laughs> I'm diving into the, to the viscera autonomics mm. thing and trying not to, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm trying not to go down the neuroimmunology rabbit hole. Um, I'm trying we not tried. to go down ACEs because, Mm. because you know and and ptsd and all of these yeah um, i'm trying to find something that is a population that i can manage and work with and get some data that actually means something so so i'm doing my phd in physiology i'm not doing it in physiotherapy that was quite important to me because mm. i was terrified of physiology as a student and i thought it was the most difficult thing in the world so now i'm getting my phd in physiology good for you good for you but no, it, it's so it's childish the, and it makes total sense because it's the basic science that we need to answer these questions yeah i did have a question it's, it's not the paper. protocol that i want it's the understanding of the phenotypes and mm. i'm anticipating increasingly we're going to have people with biological issues you know primarily biological primarily um <coughs> my kid was allergic to bloody everything I mean everything he had eczema he had constipation he's still he's got seasonal chest issues I nebulized this kid daily until he was five so he could breathe you know um because that's what mommy does he's much 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 better now but every single system in his body that could threw up an allergic reaction um until his systems became more robust 
but it just ties in with so much else about the profile and how sensitive individuals with less filters and more perception, etc. Um, you, as I always say, you can poison some patients and you can, and other pe people giving them a cheese sandwich is the end of the world. Yeah, well, that and that talk speaks to a lot of, I think we've already talked about this when we, we chatted um, after the South African one, but uh, we, we know that there are a number of non-bladder related, but basically co comorbidities that are all um, immunocentric. If you take them back, I mean, it's depression, migraine, that kind of stuff. But really, that's a neuroimmune functional issue. And then Allergies. if you take it a step further, it becomes autoimmune. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, um, so it's the maladaptation, it's the maladaptation and dysregulation to the point of self-attack. Yeah. Yeah. And oh, we see all of those conditions and ramping up and, you know, classically in the visceral pain syndromes, you can... Uh, th there's so many different ladders produced of the timeline of when people get things and then they become chronic pelvic pain. Um, and whether the initial driver or trigger was a bad sexual experience or hemorrhoids or an episiotomy that didn't heal nicely or recurrent bladder infections or a rather nasty little flush that wouldn't go or sitting one day to blah, 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 blah. Um, you know, it, it doesn't really matter. It's once things become switched on, they then extrapolate and play out with increasing levels of dysregulation and vulnerability yeah. and then they lack the interoception mm -hmm. or the imagery to be able to correct the train that's gone off the rails well that's one of the things that we were looking at recently with the house paper katie that if you come across the house 2015 <laughs> paper on interception i'll send it I'll, to you h-a-a-s uh, yeah h-a-a-s-e i'll send it over um you. you've got it <laughs> perfect <laughs> Your share That's screen works really well. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, zoom in, zoom in. <laughs> but that, um, basically, that that paper's done a a lovely job of extrapolating that people with high interception tend to have high resilience to stress, and those with low interception tend to have low resilience to stress. And I know you'll like this one, so I thought you'd, um, from an autonomic point of view, and they theorize that um, people with low interoception, interse interoception may, uh, we know that resilience um, and higher resilience is, in a, is key in the ability to recover from pain states and um, the ability to accept and, and live alongside trauma and pain states. People with chronic pelvic pain specifically have low resilience. And I can't remember what other papers that is, but I've seen that several times before. So, they theorize that the interoception or maladaptations in interceptive abilities um, may be one of the maintainers of uh, longer term persisting pain. And one of the things they did, they did the brain scans, didn't they do, Katie, the, when they look at the insula, because they say that people with yes, low, yeah, low interceptive ability um, use a greater deal of processing through the anterior insula. Um, and they theorize that that is you don't you you having to use a lot of brain power all the time to just understand normal processes coming in your bowels full your bladders full that kind of stuff whereas those people with higher levels of interoception have very little activity at the insula with um so they did a stress test of breath uh difficulty with breathing so they had them in masks and they had to really <gasps> for 40 seconds to get the air um, and they found that the insular recognition of this didn't change very much. And that allows these people to have much more complex processing going on at all times, um, which would then allow them to do things like limbic management of stress. Whereas patient, because we know that limbic system is massively involved in pain states. So, um, and I think that's hugely, hugely important in our patients that we're seeing. And it makes a lot of sense. It takes them a longer time to understand what's going on. They can't really understand what's going on within them because it doesn't it doesn't quite make sense. And then, you know, the patients that I see a lot and I'm sure the ones with vestibular dynia, they um, have a real altered sense of what is happening down there. It just feels wrong. Remind me when you said body image, was that about pain states? No, that's just uh, so the, the three points of how you understand. I've got your a body, my... your body model, body image, body schema. schema. Please send that to me. Yeah. Let me write these down. Thank you. That's Ben Wand who did the original free pack. 
So I've got the free pack, the the thing, the please do our thing and send us your information. You know, the click on the link and go and. Uh, we, do you know when it's going to be validated and done? Uh, in process. Um, I might be involved in a little bit of it, depending on awesome. from a PhD point of view. I might be using it. Um, but I know that I spoke to Judith last night and she said that they are um, they're looking at the language at the moment. But you can you can use it. You can play with it and just see how, how you're getting on with it. Um, yeah, it's but the only question we have. Oh, sorry, this is very self-centered. You know how we get. Um, am I completely crazy or is what I'm saying of interest and does it make sense and is it coherent and or are you going to laugh at me behind my back when you next see? <laughs> No, you're going to do no, it in front of my face. I'm trying to take it all in right now. Because yeah. I think that ultimately the question that you're boiling down to is of utmost importance. Mm. And I'm trying really hard not to get hung up on the skin rolling thing because I know that because I, I know that you're not like I know that you're not saying skin rolling magically fixes this. It's it's exactly what it is. It's it's the why. Mm. Right. And I think we see that with some other mm -hmm. manual based mm -hmm. treatments, too. Yeah. So I'm really curious about about the physiology that's taking place within that type of treatment method. And, and it's and, such a and, such and, a yeah. large question. Mm. And, and if you don't measure the physiology, you can't say it's happened. You can't just say my patients got better because I did this. Yeah. Um, and then we can also phenotype patients and not. Yeah, I think phenotyping is very important. Um, it's what we're all, it's the golden nugget that we're all working towards, mm. isn't it? Yeah, I think- It um, is a stinking hot day in Cape Town. It is absolutely boiling. <laughs> <laughs> Cold here. I have things. snow banks up to my window outside. Oh, oh I could do with some <laughs> snow. <laughs> and I could do with a trip to Cape Town, so. <laughs> Well, Hopefully you will both come soon and we will be able to sit in the sun and do this kind of conversation but with a, a glass of wine in hand. My in-laws are there, so I would love to go. One come. day. One <laughs> someday. Day, <come>. <laughs> someday. <laughs> one day, one day, definitely. Um to answer your question, though, I think I think as Katie said, you're doing something incredibly important and I'm I'm really, really, really in, genuinely interested to see what, what what comes out of your studies. I think it's a really hard question to answer. Um, and I don't know enough about the physiology of it to know how you can, how you're going to be able to quantify that that's what's going on. Um, you know, beyond where my bias is, would sit within more of the psychology realm and the, the physiology of parasympathetic relaxation. Um, of a system with anything uh, but I you know it's hugely important and it's absolutely the crux of driver in most of our pain states isn't it this potential autonomic underlying we know it is it's well well researched Chalimsky and all the rest of them like masses of them in the map research network have spent years mm -hmm. quantifying autonomic issues and and yeah, I mean, I've I've got them all in my proposal right here. Um, the and and looking at the the different impacts, whether it's a but because of course we're not talking about some of the congenital dysautonomias where you know where these people are seriously unwell. Mm -hmm. um, this is more of a dysregulation rather than. Um, some of the congenital stuff, which which mostly flies completely over my head and is is very complicated, but it's these subtle shifts out of a balanced state, mm. uh, which then make me wonder why I'm sitting at a computer. I should be walking on the beach with the sun on my back and the sand. <laughs> because know. it makes your brain feel happy to talk about these things. No, that's true. That is very true. I'm so grateful for this opportunity, and I have to say this has been the highlight of my week. Oh, you told me I'm not crazy. crazy. You're not crazy. You're not crazy. <laughs> You're not crazy. No. It's, it's hard to wrap your head around um, the new information. And I think I'm going to be thinking about this for the next month. Yeah. Yeah. I think maybe in six months time, we should all get back together and have another chat about it and see where you're at and what, how we've come on with our thinking and you have as well. That would be. Can I send you a few more little papers? Mm -hmm. I've got some lovely, I've got a lovely 
Coxon paper on endometriosis and the various pain, various, various types of pain associated from nociceptive to neuropathic and inflammatory pain and all that, how, yes. And I've, I've got, I've got, I've got a thousand articles on pain, neuroimmunology, everything visceral, all the psychosocial stuff, adverse childhood experiences, the autonomic stuff. And it's trying to push it together, all these different fields and clouds and kind of make them come together. And now yeah, I'm thinking- Send us think, along. Yeah, definitely. I'd love some reading. And um, now I'm, I'm thinking that what we're interested in, in GMI, but it's not called GMI, is um, we've got to find another word for it. Um, is potentially, I mean, like we're theorizing why it works, but that's a very strict phenotype. It's possibly going to be patients that are more psychologically driven or have real true somatosensory maladaptations that we're able to tap into and we get the concurrent parasympathetic change and all the rest of it, but it's a very specific different phenotype. Um, how we phenotype, how we find them, how we find it's going to, who it's going to work for, you know, before we make every Tom, Dick and Harry sit down and look, look at lots of pictures of vaginas. Um, who did I, oh, there was someone I was talking to the other day that said, um, oh, on Twitter, there was a, uh, explain your research in three um, graphics, you know, three emojis. <laughs> and I was just like pictures, emojis. peach and, you know, brain or something. Uh, and I was like, <laughs> I explained it to someone the other day as like basically uh, the proper words for interception and greater machinery, blah, 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 somatosensory distortions. Um, why, why do things feel different and how do they feel different? But actually at the end of the day, it's just, if we show someone a picture of a vagina, why do they feel better? And the person came back or to me and well, I know what I feel better. Or worse. <laughs> or worse. Yeah. Or, worse, or yeah. worse. Yeah. 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 I'm sure many people feel better looking at pictures of vaginas. That's called porn. Yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> Jilly, what are you up to? <laughs> I have no <laughs> idea. In <the> imagery. <laughs> you do not want to see my computer. Oh, well, Katie, that was hilarious. <laughs> I literally snorted. So Katie's made this amazing, amazing, really, really helpfully useful vulva image bank of hundreds of photos of vulvas in treatment. And That's who you are. I know who you are. Yeah. That's who you are. <laughs> I know you. She oh, now, she's, quick, she's quickly becoming my research wife. I think I need to call you that now. <laughs> I've got a work wife and now you're my research wife. Um, but lovely. It's, she's got this fantastic bank and she sent it, the images to me the other day so I could put them in a presentation and, and have a look and use them. And they're so good. Um, I'm happy to send them to you as well if you'd like. I don't know if they're useful to you at all. <laughs> I would be most grateful. I would be most grateful. Um, it's a rather I, I large not... file. I will not share anything. I will not share anything. And I would be most grateful. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. You can use them. Just reference them. Of course. Well, well yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Much appreciate. We always reference anyone who inspires us. And on that note, Jilly, I've just done a mummy MOT lecture on Thursday and someone was asking about IC and I said, well, please contact Jilly Bond. Oh, and posted your details. You know, disseminate learning. It's what we're all about. I don't mind. But um, lovely. Thank you. Anyway, um, I opened this file. I was trying to work outside of the house so that um, I didn't have small voices. Um, but it was an error. So I opened this lovely image bank while in a massive cafe and snorted. Um, because I just thought they probably think I'm looking at porn. I can't look at this now. Close the computer immediately. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But suddenly you know, everyone's clustered around you. And that's very environmental, you know, environmental based. If you if we look at it in that place, it becomes funny. If I look at it when I'm in work or in a serious, you know, or, or so much. We, I more and more I feel we're very much half and half in psychology and perceptual distortions. But I think that's it's it, you can't you can't take them away from each other because it's such an intimate and emotionally driven area. So, yeah, thank you so much for telling us about your um. Uh, your work it sounds thrilling genuinely yeah. okay. to see what happens next thank you and thanks for inviting me and can i just say that this conversation at times has touched on quantum health yeah. the study of that which is between rather than that which is we're trying to look at those connections so that is a now I'm fantastic like a real word. word yeah quantum, quantum health. health i am stuck in some sort of black hole of quantum health right now <laughs> We're in the darkness, oh. definitely. Yeah. <laughs> that 
Yeah. This has been awesome. Thank you very much. And next time or whenever I'm a mixed uh, invited, I will say yes. So this time works brilliantly for me. And I look forward to seeing you both again at some stage soon. Yes. Ah, yes. Again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Karina. We'll see you again thank soon. Thank you. All the best. Bye. Bye. Bye.